Nature once determined how we survive. Now we determine how nature survives. You have stolen my dreams, my childhood, with your empty words. Difficulty is no excuse for complacency. Unease is no excuse for inaction. We don't have much time left to make that journey. Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. Ladies and gentlemen, this is TEDx Glasgow. Kicking off this afternoon, please welcome to the stage Gurjit Singlali and Zebanisa Ahmed from the TEDx Glasgow team.
Welcome everyone to TEDx Glasgow. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today. And that includes you watching by live stream too. We hope you're ready to be inspired, debate, and take action with us today. My name's Eb. Uh, my name's Gurdjit, I remember that line. <laughs> <laughs> so unusual to be with people. It's so wonderful to see you all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Does that mean we're done? <laughs> no, we've got a lot in store for you today, but um, I'll start with a theme. So it was a 12-month theme, which is something unusual for us, but make or break, I think, sums it up quite well. And within that, we have five sub-themes that we'll be covering today, but also over the next six months. So we hope you stay engaged. Yes, we've got many more events coming up after this. So this is step one of our journey of taking climate action together. So <laughs> My turn? Yes. <laughs> Thank God we're not speakers. <laughs> and we have a professional host. Yes. <laughs> but it really is terrifying being up here. Like you've got these bright lights in your face, human beings. I'm not a mute, I'm always a mute when I'm on Zoom calls. That's oh, true, my. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's all about collaboration, embracing change. We're all responsible citizens, and today is gonna to be about informing you how to take climate action. So, let's get started. We've got six speakers, some entertainment, some live talk to have as well, deep discussions, so. And alcohol and non-alcohol for the after, well, the reception. Yes, <laughs> and if, you've, if you're watching by live stream, we hope you've got your snacks ready too. <laughs> yep. So plenty to do, lots of lovely people to meet. We hope you have a great day. And now we're gonna hand you over to Susie Cormack-Bruce. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And hello, Glasgow. Um, I am absolutely delighted to be here in the Engine Works um, because I am a huge TED Talks fan, but I'm normally down there where you guys are. Um, so it's a real thrill for me to be here on the big red spot to introduce you to our inspirational thought leaders, scientists, tech stars, creatives, activists, and it wouldn't be TEDx Glasgow without a few provocateurs. Now, the team has excelled in pulling together um, this ambitious program in these challenging times. But before we launch into the day proper, there are a few essential housekeeping items uh, to cover. Now, there is no requirement to keep your face mask on while seated. There's also no requirement to take it off if you feel more comfortable with it on. But we do ask you to mask up when you're moving around the communal areas, unless, of course, you have an exemption. exemption. Now, also, we have no fire drill scheduled for today, so if you do hear the alarm, it's the real deal. And we ask you to make your way in an orderly fashion to your nearest designated exit. Now, our wonderful TEDx volunteers will be in hand to guide you to whichever exit is nearest you, but they are all clearly marked. Now, as all of the talks today are being recorded live for the TEDx Glasgow website, as well as being live streamed via Twitter and YouTube, if you could refrain from chatting during the talks, we would very much appreciate that. And of course, our speakers would too. And do make sure that your mobiles and any other devices are now on silent. If you've not done so already, now is also the time to download the TEDx Glasgow app from tedxglasgow.bezer.com because as well as keeping up with today's programme, the app is also your opportunity to pose a question directly to our speakers during our question and answer sessions. And it's also where you will find details of our climate action pledges. Now, we're also really keen to get you involved in the conversation online and spread the word. So get tweeting and posting on social media, please. And let's get TEDx Glasgow trending again. I really want to say let's go viral, but that has slightly different connotations these days. Now, all of the details you need to get um, online and get involved are on the screen behind me. So it's at TEDx Glasgow with the hashtags TEDx Glasgow and make or break. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram, I think. 
Now, all of our speakers, ha Twitter handles are also on the app, so please get involved and share this brilliant day with the rest of the world. Okay, so let's go on with the show. And the first speaker to take to the TEDx Glasgow stage today is a man who left a successful career in advertising and music to play his part in making the world a greener place. Thanks in part to the three weeks he spent on a landfill site for a television show. Since the camera stopped, he has gone on to become one of the UK's most prolific eco-entrepreneurs. So opening the show with his talk entitled Possibility Consciousness, for the first time today, please put your hands together and give an enormous TEDx Glasgow welcome to my Green Pod co-founder and creator of the P Awards, Jarvis Smith. Have you ever wondered why you incarnated at this time to this planet in this crisis? I'm going to try and unpick this a little bit, but I ask of you just to create a space in your mind for possibility consciousness. Don't dismiss, don't accept, just a hmm. In 2006, I had the strangest invitation I got a call from Channel 4 to ask if I would like to be on an eco-observational documentary. Didn't know what the show was about, but we knew we were going to have to live on an extreme environment. There were the usual cast that was invited. There was the gay guy, the model, the alpha male, me, the tree-hugging hippie. The TV researchers knew that I had been training with a female shaman for 10 years, so I was seen as a pretty weird guy. They put us up in a hotel at Gatwick Airport the night before. In the morning, they put us on a blacked out coach. We drove around for two hours. We were all discussing, where are we going? Borneo, to the Amazon, to the Arctic. We stopped, the doors opened, there were screams! There were piles and piles of rubbish everywhere. We were dumped in the middle of a landfill in Croydon. Now, the show was to highlight what is one person's waste is another person's gold. When we throw things away, there is no away. And actually, what we are throwing away, could it be repurposed or recycled? Now, we had to build somewhere to sleep, somewhere to shower, somewhere to eat, somewhere to sh go to the toilet. After three weeks, we made this place our home. We embraced it, because this could happen to any of us at any time. New Orleans, the tsunami, the volcanic eruption. Think about it. Now, on the third week, one morning, the local dustbin truck went round the streets, as it does across all the country, picked up the rubbish, brought it to our home, dumped it on our site. We had to wear these protective clothing, masks. Bloody hell, masks, dare I say it. Now, we started siphoning through this stuff. We had to decide, could it, did it have to go to landfill? Could it be recycled? After about 20 minutes, I began to feel sick, nauseous, headachey like the worst hangover after your 18th birthday, that kind of feeling. Now, because I'd had some shamanic training, I knew how to let go and release toxic energies in my body. So I laid on the earth, I began to breathe, release, release, release. I took a huge breath in to replenish, to revitalize. As I did, I felt this shock like a bolt of lightning go through me. I heard these words, how you are feeling now is how I feel. I'm sick and I need your help to tell people. Now that might sound strange, but in your space of possibility consciousness, this was true to me. I weeped, I committed to camera that I would dedicate my life's work to educating, inspiring, 
and finding solutions so people could help to mitigate what we now know is a climate crisis. I became a celebrity of trash. I was invited to panels to speak. Within a year, I launched the world's biggest ethical lifestyle magazine with National Geographic, National Geographic Green. What we do today at My Green Pod is simply an extension of that. Now, one of the panels that I was invited to was World Travel Market. I was the sustainable guy. I remember somebody in the audience, and this question would come up a lot. If you were world leader, what would you do? What's the one thing that you would get people to do to change? And I always said, the first thing I do is get people to stop. Because until we stop what we're doing, we're not going to be able to understand cause and effect. And lo and behold, the pandemic arrived. We all stopped. Now, as awful as this was, and I've lost a family member in this time, it's a blip in the grand scheme of what's going to happen with the climate crisis, unless we can turn things around in the next nine years. Now, the important thing about this is that there are lots of businesses and lots of organizations trying to change things. We know that. I've been working with a huge organization that challenges the government. Now, part of their research shows that 60% of the problem is human behavior. In the latest IPCC report, there were two really poignant things. One is that we are beyond the point of irreversible damage. The second, that humans are causing the temperatures to rise. So what are we going to do about it? Now, I was asked to do some thought leadership work with the UNFCCC, the organizers of COP26, happening just around the corner. They've been doing some work with, an org with a part of the organization called Resilience Frontiers. They've been talking to the indigenous cultures around the world, who are actually custodians of 80% of the world's ecosystems. Now, the indigenous principles, there's many, but two of them are really important. One of them is that they treat the Earth, Mother Nature, Gaia, as a conscious, living being. Now, think about that. The second one is, before they take from the Earth, they give something first. It could be a prayer. It could be a dash of water before they drink, a bit of food before they eat. But they're in relationship. They're in co-creation. Now, guess what, guys? We are all indigenous. Every single one of us. The problem is we're born into a system that isn't serving us. It's killing us. The system that causes consumers to consume means to use it all up until it's gone. We need to let go of that label and perhaps consider how we can become restorers. Now, let's look at the mother analogy for a moment. We all have them, or we are them. Would we let our mother get that sick? Would we take and take and take? Yes, as toddlers, definitely as teenagers, but as adults, no way. And if our mother was sick, we would drop everything. We would sit by her bedside. We would nurse her back to health until she recovered. Why aren't we doing that with the planet? It's a big question. Could I ask you all for a moment to indulge me and close your eyes? Take a few deep breaths and really just gather up your beingness. Just connect with that inner place of stillness. And in that place of stillness, in your mind's eye, I want you to take yourself to the happiest place on earth. The place that makes you feel the best you've ever felt, the most alive. How does it feel? Where are you? Now, just for a moment, open your eyes, come back to the room, take another breath, reconnect with where you are. Now, just by a show of hands, how many of you were shopping? See, that answers my question. We're born into a system that is taking us away from our truth. 
So I ask you this, next time you buy something or eat something or use something, could you actually think, where does this come from? Could you clean up your lifestyle and buy from brands that are not toxic, not feeding a money makes the world go round system? We all know that's a lie. I think that if we can take a step back, let nature regenerate, restore itself, just like we saw in the pandemic, in a matter of weeks, you could see the Himalayas from 20, 30 miles away. Nature began, began to come back. We could hear birdsong. We reconnected. Imagine if we could do that for the next eight or nine years. Is it too much to ask? Is that the state of consciousness that we need to evolve to? And with this newfound consciousness, maybe anything and everything is possible. Thank you. Anything and everything could be possible. I mean, <laughs> what a way to leave a talk. Now, just another quick reminder that it's not too early to get tweeting. It's at TEDxGlasgow, hashtag TEDxGlasgow, hashtag make or break. And of course, you can add to our Instagram story um, on, and follow events on our Facebook page. Um, that includes you, our live stream viewers too. So let's meet our next speaker. The woman we are about to welcome to the stage is a rare breed, as she genuinely, actively, and passionately believes that business can be a force for good. She's also of the opinion that accountants can save the world. Here with her talk, How to Be Both in Business and an Activist, please give it up for the co-founder and activist in residence at B-Lab UK, Charmaine Love. Activist. What comes to mind for you when you hear that word? Do you think of people sitting on the road, blocking traffic? Do you think of people standing, marching, holding signs? Do you know somebody who's been arrested? Does it remind you of possibly a tricky conversation you've had with your kids or your grandkids who have joined a youth strike? Does it make you feel a bit uncomfortable? Activist. It's a bit of an edgy word, right? Here's something I don't think you do think about. People in suits. Because it's a contradiction. Business is a big part of the problem, right? So how can people in business also be activists? Well, to all the business people out there, this is a time for us to be thinking about our power to be a part of the change. Because it's not just possible to be a business activist. Right now, it's needed. So let me take you to the moment where this really came alive for me. Okay? I was invited to be on a panel at a big corporate event, lots of suits in the audience. And the question we were asked was, in the field of sustainability, when and how should entrepreneurs also be activists? It's a good question, right? Well, I have to say, as an entrepreneur working in this space, I answered that question as best I could. And then afterwards, I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe I need to better understand what it is to be an activist. Now, here's a little bit about me. I am much more of a natural rule follower than a rebel. 
but this scary climate science has made me start to question whether our current rules are really cutting it. So here I am. It is a spectacular spring morning, 2019, and I find myself early in the morning on Waterloo Bridge. And the sky is this incredibly stunning color of blue. And I'm surrounded by what feels like hundreds of people. Some are waving brightly colored flags that are flapping in the wind. Others are handing out stickers and badges. And I'm there, and I have no idea what to do. And then these drums start playing. And I, I can't explain it, other than to say it just feels like I'm full of electricity, and I'm feeling absolutely connected to all these people on the bridge, even though I've never seen them before. And over the days and the weeks and the months that follow, I'm linking arms with some moms that I know from the school run, and we're holding up banners we made the night before while our kids were playing behind us in Trafalgar Square and standing right up to police, feeling really strong. And then I'm in Oxford Circus, and I'm handing out cut pieces of cucumber on a super hot day, while these protesters are dancing around a bright pink boat. It's totally surreal, right? And then <laughs> I'm getting yelled at to go get a job. And I have to hold my tongue, because I kind of want to yell back, I have an MBA from Harvard! And then I'm feeling challenged, <laughs> because some of these activations are going too far. And I'm getting nervous, because I'm not understanding all of what these protesters want to do, and I don't agree with it. And I'm getting scared, because I don't want to be arrested. Now, it feels right to be out there, like I'm doing something and like I'm part of something, but I'll tell you, it's hard at home when you're driving in your car and your son in the back seat starts to cry when news of the protests come on the radio, and you ask him, what's going on? And he says, Mom, I'm sad, and I don't know why. Or when your husband, who you love and who absolutely loves you too, um, and who absolutely also agrees that there is a climate emergency. But he doesn't agree with the approach of some of the protesters because he thinks it's putting blame on others rather than on ourselves. Um, when he says to you that if you do get arrested, he's not going to bail you out. And you believe him. But you both understand the massive amount of privilege you have because you have a whole lineup of friends that you know would. So these are hard things to overcome, my friends, but I'll tell you what is harder is the realization that as someone who works in business, I am complicit in the system I am protesting against. I benefit from it. I live in a nice house, in a nice neighborhood, I have a nice hybrid electric car. And I'm a hypocrite. I still eat meat, and I still sometimes forget to use my reusable cup. And despite my best of intentions, I know I'm using products and services that are part of the problem. Unfortunately, the way our systems are set up right now, it's nearly impossible not to be a hypocrite. And that's because, for the most part, businesses run in pursuit of profit, no matter what the cost to people and the planet. It's not working. It's killing us. We can feel it, and we know we need to do something. We need to do something for the beauty of this Earth. We need to do something for our health, both our physical and our mental well-being. We need to do something for our kids. And let's be clear, I don't mean my kids, or your kids, or your kids. I mean our collective kids. And so that we can 
answer them when they ask us, what did we do when we knew? And yeah, we need to do something for business, because you know what? There is no business on a burning planet. So here's the dilemma. This system's not going to fix itself, which is why we need people in business, people on the inside to be part of this change. Now, I recently took on this really great new job at B-Lab UK as an activist in residence. And that job's all about exploring what this new frontier of leadership in business looks like when businesses engage in activism, building bridges between companies and movements. Now, B-Lab, as many of you may know, is the organization that certifies B Corps, for-profit businesses that operate to deliver returns to both shareholders and stakeholders. We, I'm sure, have quite a few of them in the room today. I know John from Volans is here. And in this role that I have, I've had the chance to capture and learn so many interesting stories of where businesses are engaging, where they're activating. Companies that are supporting people to engage in movements, like the search engine Ecosia, which pays the legal fees for their employees that are arrested due to nonviolent civil disobedience. And Finisterre, a UK clothing brand that hosted an ocean activist training camp as part of their C7 campaign, which happened at the same time as the G7 here in the UK. But it's not just about getting people into these movements and onto the streets. Some businesses are doing their thing by taking a stand on the issues that matter to them. Patagonia recently pulled its products from a high-end resort in Jackson Hole when they caught wind that that resort had hosted a right-wing conference. And Patagonia also supports and funds bold, direct action organizations that are focused on root cause of the environmental crisis. Now, other businesses are joining forces, engaging in ambitious coalitions and collectives that are focused on changing the rules of the game, changing entire industries. Tribe Impact Capital is working with others to amend the company law and to challenge accounting practices, because as Peter Backer wrote in the Harvard Business Review, accountants will save the world. Now, there are three things that have become clear in these conversations with these activist businesses. When they believe, they really believe that we all must move faster, aim higher, dig deeper, and act much more effectively together as a movement of movements to address the climate emergency. They also recognize that there is this really important line. This is about business as a tool for activism, not activism as a tool for business. They also have a really exquisite focus, crystal clear on doing the things that are needed, what the science is telling us is needed. They're not limited by the things that simply feel possible. Now, this is important because business has power. Increasingly, we're seeing governments look to business for permission. What businesses do and say matters. And I've recently been reminded of the Peter Parker principle. Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. Business and people in business have a responsibility and an opportunity to use their power as a force for good, to drive change, to be on the right side of history, to make history, and to bring others along with them. Now, you might be thinking, hey, I work in a good company. I have good sustainability programs and ESG. Well, that's good. But ask yourself, is it good enough for what the science is telling us we need to do? Now, let's go back to the word we started right with, activist. Activist. In essence, to me, an activist is someone who acts, who takes action, who activates to direct change. I like to think it's someone who stands up, stands for a change they want to see. It starts by understanding our power and what we want to do with it, and then choosing what kind of activism you want to be engaged in. How do you decide what is good and what is bad activism? That's a call that you can make. I use science as my North Star. It does not mean you have to get arrested. 
but it does mean you need to face up and be willing to speak up some pretty uncomfortable truths, because problems cannot be fixed unless we acknowledge them. And it can be risky to call that out. It can be re have real career and social risk, but my friends, the risk of not doing anything at all is far greater. Now, if you're fe feeling fired up and you're thinking, I want to be a business activist, I want to be an activist in residence, what can you do? Be bold. In every single meeting, in every single conversation you find yourself in, bring up the climate emergency. Be inspired by these other activist businesses, those that are finding ways to support their people to engage, that are taking a stand, that are joining with others to change the rules and to change entire industries. Invite in some activists and listen to them. And yeah, experience that electricity on the street and bring others along with you. You might not get it right. I certainly haven't. And I have been criticized by both sides. But I'll tell you what I find more unbearable than making a mistake, being criticized, is not doing anything at all. Now, finding others can make this easier. Those with a similar desire to act, they can hold you when things get tough, and it will. But you're not alone. And it's okay to be scared because this is scary stuff. I'm scared. But what is not okay? is to sit back and do nothing in this moment that really, really matters. It's hard, but as people in business know, it's when things are hard that we go into new areas. And we need to go to those new areas now. Because if it were easy or safe, we would have already done it. Now, I am hopeful, because around the world, I am seeing people in business waking up, standing up, and acting up. And I'm inspired by this word from botany, that I learned a few years ago, heliotropy. It literally means to turn towards the sun. And I see a field of sunflowers, and as that sun crosses the sky, they follow it, moved by its warmth, its light, and its positivity. But sunflowers don't just float up into the clouds. Sunflowers are radical. Radical in the origin of that word, which is rooted. They are deeply rooted to the ground from which they grow from. So I think we need to all take inspiration from these sunflowers. I think we must find ways to be hopeful and optimistic about the change we know we need to make, and we must be rooted to the ground, rooted to the science, and rooted to the urgency to act now. It is hard, but it is not a contradiction. This is about being both and, both in business and an activist. So join me. Get on your real or metaphorical power suits. And then get ready to add a little bit of color and a little bit of activist edge. You will not regret it. Charmaine, love everybody. Now, I don't know if somebody set this up, but with Charmaine talking about blocking traffic, we have a blocking traffic situation outside. Now, not sure if it's going to be anybody in the room, but we have a car that is blocking the road and is likely to be towed. Now, the registration number is AM06JCM. So registration am 6 GCM. So if it is your car, please, if you could remove it, that would be great. Okay, now we're about to switch things up a little here at TEDx Glasgow by inviting today's creator, Gurdjit Singh Lali, back onto the stage along with one of Scotland's most accomplished activists. And that is no exaggeration. He helped establish Stop Climate Chaos Scotland, the largest coalition ever formed in Scotland, created qualification in climate solutions for business leaders, and in his role as Chief Executive of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, he is also an advisor to government, businesses and various universities. With the seats, well, definitely now set, please welcome to the TEDx Glasgow stage, Mike Robinson and Gurdjit Singh Lali.
Mike, welcome. Thank you. So you've been involved in climate change a long time. And a lot of people in this room also, and on the live stream. What keeps you motivated and what keeps you going? I, I think I never grew up, actually. <laughs> um, I was always told when I was a child that uh, you know, the environment mattered and, and that idea that the, the Earth was actually an integral part of human existence, and I believed them. So when I started work, um, I, I suddenly discovered that actually people didn't really want me to do anything about that. They sort of wanted me to leave that at the door. And I just never grew up, so I didn't. And uh, so that's really part of how I think I keep going. I'm just very passionate about the issue. But the motivation, actually drawing on Charmaine's talk, really, is about being active. That's what keeps me going. And uh, I think, for me, one of the things that I really believe matters is that you should try and do things that you don't necessarily know how to finish. If it's the right thing to do, just have a go. And it's amazing how people come around you, that serendipity kicks in, and, and people just reach out and help. And uh, the number of projects that I've done where I had no idea how to get it through and across the finishing line, but actually just getting on, doing the right thing, it'll work out. So naivety serves you well. Aye, naivety and just general <laughs> hope. <laughs> um, you've described this next decade as a decade of hope. Is that not unduly optimistic? I think we live in a very divided world and there's lots of things that are sort of pulling us apart and making things difficult. But fundamentally, climate change is a shared issue and it is the greatest opportunity for us to come together as a global community around a shared agenda and actually deliver something really positive and meaningful. So what's stopping us? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things stopping us, I guess. A lot of people are trying to do that. But um, for me, I think a lot of it comes down to understanding. I was having a meeting with finance companies recently, not that long ago, and they were very excited. They were talking about the nine trillion of disinvested funds on the international market. But they also said something that really struck me, and that was that they were surprised as a global community that coal had become uninvestable in the space of two or three years. And when I heard that comment, I realized two things. The first was that they really shouldn't have been surprised it was fairly obvious 20 years previously that coal was not something we wanted to see you know, perpetuate into the future. But the other thing I realized was that I could actually read the future as far as they were concerned. Because I've been steeped in this world for so long, it's not a surprise. So we took that as a, a prompt to try to help businesses get up to speed quickly. I'm not, I, I really feel that we have to target people of my generation and older to sort this problem out now. And we need, if we want people to change, what I have learned is you've got to make it as easy as possible for people to change. And that's why we produced a, a course aimed at managers to try to help share the information that everybody should know. And considering it's going to affect every facet of our lives, every, every facet of business. It's where you're going to get your resources, your staff, every single facet, the legislation that's coming, all of this, it's market prescience. So if you don't know it, why are you running a business? So it's really important that people wake up to the issue, understand their responsibility, but most importantly, I think, focus on the solutions, focus on the doing. And um, I want to, to ask you about a couple of big issues. Uh-oh. <laughs> and how to solve them. Great. Um, in particular, money. You mentioned finance there. Agency. And oppiness. Well, money, um, I, I believe very strongly, is a very famous quote that you judge a government by its budget. If you don't finance something, how is it going to happen? And if you say something and you're committed to something, why aren't you putting resource behind it? So we absolutely must find ways to finance this transition. 
there's a strong evidence that maybe 2% GDP to move that transition forward now. In Scotland, that's three and a half billion pounds a year. That's less than the public expenditure budget for Scotland. But maybe we need new ways of doing that, maybe new ways of finding money. I'd love to see some sort of future generations fund based on some, some taxation, possibly even on renewables, that we actually build, a bit like the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. What an amazing legacy that is to pass over to young people that we're properly investing in their future and we're actually creating serious wealth to allow them to help move that transition forward. So money's critical, it's an absolute measure of genuine commitment. But agency is really important and something I come across with businesses all the time. We were running a sustainability event with a large corporate and they came up with 170 ways that they could improve their business. And then suddenly, at the end of the day, having had this exciting, positive, very dynamic sort of event, they sort of, there was a collective slump of the shoulders in the room. And I sort of probed this and asked why suddenly everybody looked a bit downhearted. And they said that they couldn't enact any of these 170-odd ideas. And I'm like, well, why? What on earth are you on about? Surely you can enact this. And they cited this really futile example, which was that they had a coffee company that provided coffee for their headquarters office, and in the contract it said they weren't allowed to bring their own mug. Now, don't get me wrong, you're not going to solve the climate crisis by bringing your own mug to a coffee shop, but it was actually symbolic of their lack of empowerment, their lack of traction within the business. And so agency is critical. What we have to do, and managers have to do, is they've got to give the people that want to do the right thing the power, the authority, the mandate, the traction. In Scotland in 2009, we passed a Climate Act for 42% reductions by 2020. The most important, in my opinion, outcome of that act was it empowered people in all sorts of organisations to actually start to do the right thing. Joined Uppiness as well, you forgot. Yeah, yeah Uppiness. <laughs> yeah, Joined Uppiness. This is a classic. We're not very good at Joined Uppiness. We've got more and more and more specialist, more siloed, and we've forgotten to join it back up together. Transport, classic case in point. Nobody in aviation talks to anybody in rail, talks to anybody in roads, talks to anyone in active travel. There are really big problems out there. The best example I had, just for a laugh, is I was talking to an academic at a university that I won't name, and I said, oh, you must know so-and-so. And he said, no, I've never heard of them. I said, you must know them, they're in your department. He said, no, no, honestly, I've never heard of them. And we came out of his office and he locked his door because we're gonna go and get a coffee. And it was the next door had this guy's name on it. And you're like, good grief, you're not even talking to people in your own department. We really need to open up the conversation. And a classic case in point, think about anything you want, but retail came across recently. We have a real problem with town centres. Don't just ask retailers what the answer is. Ask all the people that bring solutions. Same with agriculture. Don't just ask farmers what the answer is. We know we need it to be much broader. So bring in the land managers. Bring in the others that can help, the scientists that can support that. And start actually valuing all the different uh, expertise and issues that people can bring. We need to spend time more joined up -y. Joined up us. Um, so, ha I have to ask this question, but how did you get, manage to get involved in so many different areas? I guess my, I'm very fortunate, I have, um, I'm an idiot, and I, I'm always looking for where efforts required, always looking for the things that we can do next. Every single one of us is on a journey, and we're all at different points on that journey. Some of us are on that journey through choice, and some of us are going to be on that journey whether we like it or not because climate change is not optional. So wherever you are on that journey, A, I think recognize that, recognize there's always a next step. And what is that next step? So for me, I'm quite fortunate that I've managed to get to a point where I can dip into different places. I'm involved in agriculture because that's one of the areas that's not showing reductions at the moment. I'm involved in transport for the same reason. I'm involved in climate education because I think there's a great need and I'm involved in city development and city advice because again cities is part of the whole framework like Glasgow obviously with its net zero commitments so I'm, all I do is tend to move 
where are most needed. So, what do you think we can all do when it comes to tackling climate change? There's lots of things each of us can do, but the thing I always want to ask for first is that I want you to welcome change. We all know we need to change. Business as usual is a dirty word in climate change. So if it's the way that we've always done it, don't do it that way. The thing that I think is really possible going forwards is that we genuinely need to rethink everything. Everything's on the table. So we need the best of everybody to step up and play a part. Everything is up for grabs. Even the way we count our money. GDP is a terrible measure of success. Everybody knows that. Even Simon Kuznets that invented GDP thought it was a terrible measure of success. And yet we continue to use it and don't look more broadly. So the first thing is just absolutely we need to embrace all of everybody's skills, bring the best of yourself to out and be innovative and thoughtful and creative. We absolutely need that because we have never been sustainable as a species. So we need to do it for the first time ever. But the other thing I want to ask you for is permission. We know we need to change, but we keep holding back change. So permit change, allow change, demand change. Politicians will not do this on their own. The only brave politicians are ex-politicians. You know, we've got to help them. We've got to provide the political space and demand the change in order to move this forwards. So I would ask everybody to allow change, embrace change, and, and permit change. On that note, Mike Robertson, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike and Gurdjieff. There we go. Now, as we know, words without action are simply blah, blah, blah. And with TEDx Glasgow's aim to achieve impact via actions, it made sense that the team launch its own proactive climate action initiatives. So here to give us a first-hand insight into those initiatives, please welcome from the TEDx Glasgow family, Hannah Wright and Roland Harwood. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry, I have to just say, can we all give another round of applause to the speakers? Because I just feel they've been absolutely amazing. <laughs> well, I'm Hannah, Head of Partnerships for TEDx Glasgow. Hi, Hannah. Hi, <laughs> Hi everyone. <laughs> it's great to be here today. We want to tell you about some collaboration that's been happening in the run-up to today's event. And hopefully, if we can, make a few more connections between different people and ideas in the room here today. Well, we all know it's crucial for saving the planet that we have to work together. We all have a mountain to climb, and no one can do it on their own. But it's difficult to know where to begin and where to go. So we want to suggest that the best place to start is right here and right now. So have a little look around the room. Um, in the next row might be someone who has the answer to a question that you're grappling with. In fact, I bet they are, I bet there is. Or somewhere else in, in the space here today might be your next collaboration partner. So we have a question for you. Uh, I'm told there are 250 people here today in the audience. So we'd like you to guess or calculate, if you happen to know uh, the formula, how many different connections could we create with 250 people in the room. In other words, if we were to have, and we're not going to do this, by the way, but if we were to have an excruciating speed networking event later on, how many different combinations could we create with 250 people? I'll tell you the answer in two minutes' time. And, oh, the best guess, if you post it on uh, Twitter with the hashtag, uh, which you should know by now, make or break or TEDx Glasgow. There's some exclusive TEDx swag. I don't actually know what it is, but I'm told it's excellent. It is yours for the best guess. So please post your guesses now. Thank you. So we all know the best way to learn is by doing. That is why TEDx Glasgow is proud to launch the Partners Climate Action Initiative. We are bringing together 18 diverse businesses 
with the ultimate goal of achieving more through collaboration, or as Mike says, joined uppiness. Um, so yeah, Jarvis was talking about possibility consciousness, and so we want to talk about possibility connection, and um, Charmian was talking about business as a force for good in the world, and we think, we hope, we know these businesses are also a force for good in the world. So can I just invite all of our partners and anyone who works for any of the organizations here on the chart to raise your hand and keep your hands raised just for a moment so we know where you are and who you are, please, partners. Raise your hand. Now, can I ask everybody else in the audience to take a look around, look at those hands, look at those faces, and later on, go up and talk to them, find out what they've been doing, and how we can all work together to achieve and tackle climate change. Great, thank you, partners. You can lower your hands. We've, already, we've been meeting since June, um, and there's already some fascinating uh, combinations, collaborations, uh, and conversations happening between this group of organizations, and we want to do more of that um, as a result of today's event. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Oh, it's yes, the answer sorry. to the quiz question. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, we all know we can um, get further and faster by working together. So, um, so yeah, the, uh, the question I asked you at the beginning, with 250 people, um, there are 31,125 different possible uh, combinations that we could create here in the room today. So we are literally a conversation away from virtually anybody and everybody. So I urge you to make the most of this opportunity. Go and talk to our partners, go and talk to each other. You never know what might happen. Thank you. Thanks. All right. I am so glad he never asked me to work out the maths. Now, we are going to take a little break from our live stream viewers. So you'll be leaving us just now, but we hope you're enjoying the show and you will come back and join us again in an hour's time. Now, we also, for you, are in...
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats as the show is about to begin. Please take your seats. gentlemen welcome back launching part two of TEDx Glasgow please go mad for stout Cooper McAlpine hello 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 how are you all getting on so just just to let you know that in in this 12 minutes that we're here for you do not need to be quiet you can make as much noise as you want and in fact if you can identify when the tunes change give us a big cheer and uh, keep us going make or break our music has been broken now for 
just about as long as we can remember. So we've decided to go back to what made us feel good about playing music in the first place, which was playing with your pals. So that is exactly what we're going to do.
match. Chris Stout, Ross Cooper, Brian McAlpine, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Ross Cooper and Brian McAlpine, because I don't know if you actually all heard the names because of the applause, So, and I don't blame you. Now, we are really keen to hear your views on today and to get your questions for our speakers. So please get busy and use the hashtags. Remember, it's TEDxGlasgow and make or break. And of course, you can craft those questions for our speakers by going on the TEDxGlasgow app. And Ryan, if you're still out there, I'm counting on you. Now, so who is ready for our next talk? Well, I hope you all are, because as well as being an award-winning world authority on corporate responsibility and sustainable capitalism, our next speaker is a best-selling author and a serial entrepreneur. He's been an evangelist for social and environmental responsibility long before it became fashionable, and he lists his recreations in Who's Who as playing with ideas, thinking around corners, and conversations with un unreasonable people. Please put your hands together for Volan's co-founder and chief pollinator with his talk, Butterflies in the Boardroom, the one and only John Elkelman. <laughs> Elkelman. Thank you. Thank you. Well, firstly, follow that. Um, I want you to imagine just for a moment, that you're a caterpillar. I mean, it might be a common or garden caterpillar, like uh, that for the cabbage white butterfly. Alternatively, it might be the caterpillar for the monarch, monarch butterfly. I'm trying to get a slide up here, and it's not coming. Well, hopefully that will be resolved. Um, there we go. Hurrah. Um, so the thing about caterpillars is that they are incredibly hungry. They're just consumed with appetite. Now, hopefully, your particular caterpillar is in a lovely garden or a vegetable plot or whatever. But you're consuming, consuming, consuming. You're never satisfied. And then one day, and you don't understand why, something happens. You lose your appetite. And then you trek off to find, find a, a, a suitable uh, branch or twig, and you spin a thread, and you hang yourself upside down and you don't know why. And then something rather extraordinary starts to happen. Your organs start to break down. Not something you particularly welcome, but that's what happens. And they go to a glue, a goo, or slurry. And in that slurry, uh, there are things called imaginal cells, the living blueprints, which, when they start off, are more or less like uh, single-cell organisms. They don't particularly seem to know what they're doing. But over time, they start to coordinate. They start to almost dance uh, to an invisible or um, inaudible musical score. And they put together the organs of the butterfly, which are nothing like uh, those of the caterpillar. And they put them th together through uh, uh, using the nutrients in that uh, slurry. And then the day comes, uh, inevitably, when the butterfly is forming uh, within the chrysalis and finally develops the strength to break out. Well, in the monarch butterfly, that's after about 8 to 12 uh, days. And then it comes out, and it hangs again uh, from the chrysalis, 
and it stretches its wings and it uh, dries them out before it flies out of the landscape. Now, that is a metaphor. We're all uh, uh, used to it. Uh, but I'm going to use it in relation to our economies and in relation to business and the financial markets. So, about 20 years ago, uh, well, firstly, I, I should just say that um, you're not caterpillars and I'm not a caterpillar, but we're all part of what, as we've heard other speakers in a way address, a caterpillar economy. And that came uh, clear very, very uh, much so earlier on this year when a group called the Global Footprint Network published the latest round of their um, uh, outreach. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the, the, there's a day in the year where uh, Earth Outreach, uh, Earth Overshoot uh, Day, I'm sorry, uh, where we as a species overtake the capacity of this planet to regenerate its resources. And when they projected that back into the 1970s, when I imagine many of you were already alive, that Earth Overshoot Day would have been in December. This year it's come down and down and down. This year it was July the 29th. And as the former Unilever uh, CEO, Paul Pullman, put it a couple of days ago, that's the day that we start to steal from future generations. So about 20 years ago, uh, in fact, exactly 20 years ago, I wrote a book called The Chrysalis Economy. It was over-optimistic. I thought that by the year uh, 2030, we would see a world where our economies were in a profound process of change, of metamorphosis. I predicted that we would see uh, industry after industry beginning to go through quite profound disruptive changes. Now you'll hear shortly from Adam Dorr of Rethink X. If you haven't come across their work on multiple different sectors, I really do recommend it very highly. Because what it shows is that whether you're in transportation and mobility, whether you're in cattle ranching and dairying, whether you're in energy or the financial markets, there are, over the next 20 or so years, there are massive disruptions coming through. We talk about butterflies in the stomach. In one sector after another, senior business people are starting to get that sense of unease. And whether they're in big coal or big oil or big meat, or big water, or whatever it happens to be, uh, they're sensing that the landscape is about to go through, starting to go through seismic uh, changes. And that's, that's the environment in which we uh, largely uh, work. Now, butterflies, uh, which is the next stage, obviously, after the chrysalis, um, are lightweight. They're very uh, easily uh, blown off course. And I say that as somebody who's set up four uh, what we now call social businesses since 1978. Uh, they all still exist. Uh, I don't know whether we could get that next slide. Yes, good, thank you. Um, they all still exist, uh, but they've all been subject to the battering of market forces and ups and downs in, in, in client interest and so on. The thing about butterflies is, though, that they're enormously important in terms of the regeneration of, a con of uh, ecosystems. So they are pollinators, uh, they also turn up in m many other animals' um, uh, food uh, chains. But there's something else that we learn uh, when we're relatively young, which is this idea of the butterfly effect. You know, a butterfly somewhere in Costa Rica flaps its wings, and somewhere else, it might be in Asia, uh, there's a typhoon or a storm. I think we're seeing that uh, butterfly effect now starting to happen in boardrooms, uh, and in uh, C-suites, and in the uh, senior teams of financial institutions, and so on. And the number of times uh, that CEOs and similar level of people have said to me, in the last year to 18 months, I'm now getting the pressure from my children at the breakfast table. I'm now getting that pressure from interns, younger people sort of coming into our industry. I'm getting it, and our recruiters are getting it, when we're talking to uh, young people that we desperately want to uh, pull in, you know, tomorrow's uh, talent. That level of questioning, that level of challenge is really starting to have a really important effect. So how extraordinary it is that a young girl in an anorak can sit down on the steps of her national parliament 
and in a very few short years, trigger this extraordinary social uh, movement. Like a number of people here, I've been out on some of the uh, school climate strike uh, marches and talked to the young people. And it's very clear they want to see change. And that won't blow, blow away uh, imminently. And I think business really has to understand that. But we have to understand something else too. And earlier on today, we heard um, uh, the case made that we don't need that much money to make this happen. I ab absolutely fundamentally disagree. And I'll give you one example of why I disagree. In 1833, the United Kingdom uh, passed the Slavery Abol Abolition Act. That year alone, it cost the Treasury 40% of its revenues and 5% of GDP, whether you believe in GDP or not. This was a huge slug of money. Now, it happened to be going to buy out the property rights of slave owners, which was a, a, an extraordinary idea. But that got slavery stopped. And one proposition I played with in the recent years is whether we're going to have to buy out the pollution rights of some of the big coal and oil companies. I really hope it doesn't come to that, but this is so urgent now, we're going to have to think about how we break uh, these patterns. Now, I'm, I'm sort of sitting on, standing on the uh, red carpet, and, and it's a wonderful color red. I mean, it, it, it's for excitement, it's for danger, it's also for... Um, risk and uncertainty, and it's for debt. And I think we're imposing uh, e ecological or intergenerational uh, debt on younger people to come. And so I sort of see this red symbolizing that too. So the question I'm going to raise today is how do we turn this red carpet, at least symbolically, over time, black? Black for intergenerational credit where we start to push Earth Overshoot Day backwards uh, towards uh, uh, December. That is going to take quite a long time. And one thing that's very striking about the monarch butterfly, and I didn't know this before I wrote the book, I thought that the same insect went right the way from Mexico, the forests there, right up through North America, into Canada in some cases, and then came back. Not so. As probably some of you will already know, it takes four to five generations of the butterfly to complete that cycle. How extraordinary is that? And that, I think, is in a sense a model of what we've now collectively got to do. And we really are not good at thinking intergenerationally. Even basic things like pensions, uh, people uh, struggle uh, with. How do we do that? I think we have to really increase the intensity of the pressures on our economies and on our business. And we've got to sustain those pressures for a considerable time to come. That means changing the rules of the game. And that means changing not just our policies, it means changing our laws, it means changing uh, economics and how that is uh, practiced, how we determine what should be valued uh, and what uh, not. Now, I always want to, uh, people keep asking uh, people like me, what do I do? And so I'm just going to give you three uh, things that I think we can collectively do. Relatively simple. First thing is just think about some of the caterpillar uh, behaviors that you practice, your family practices, your organization uh, practice. We've heard about meat consumption, we've heard about uh, all sorts of things that people might do. What am I going to do? Well, consequences in London, which is uh, where I live, dictate that from October, well, end of this month, uh, we will not be able to drive our car. I've had a car for 45 years. So I could say, I'm going to buy an electric car, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, can we get by without a car at all? So that's the first thing, caterpillar behaviors. Let's think about those. Second, the chrysalis. What can each of us, in our multiple different ways, do to increase the intensity of pressure on business, on markets, on our economies? One thing I've done is, I mean, we support many uh, NGOs, uh, activist organizations, but Client Earth is one that a number of you will have heard about. They use the law around the world to fight the coal industry, fight the oil industry, and to stop uh, new power plants being built. They're incredibly effective. They've stopped hundreds of plants uh, being built, and they're now transferring that uh, model to Asia. 
Uh, I, that, that for me is an example. I, there are many other organizations out there that you can uh, potentially support, but just go through that process of thinking. What can you do that isn't simply uh, helping a little bit of wildlife, but really puts um, pressure uh, on our economies? And the final thing is, butterflies, as I've said, are lightweight. Uh, many people in this room may well be, and online, may consider that their social enterprises and so on, in, in the economy, they're a bit like uh, the butterfly. They're, they're, again, slight, they're not incredibly heavy, um, uh, and they're blown every which way. So we need platforms, we need networks that actually link these organizations together. And among the ones that we're involved in, certainly B Lab and the B Corporation movement, the TED and TEDx network is an extraordinary way of sort of listening to some of these stories. Um, and then just launched in the United States by Paul Hawkins, some of you will know of uh, regeneration.org, an extraordinary uh, platform sort of helping people uh, in the regenerative economy and, and discover more about that. So to conclude, I asked us all to think about what it would be like to be a caterpillar. We are, whether we like it or not, uh, very much like uh, caterpillars. One thing I didn't say, though, about the monarch butterfly and other, uh, other caterpillars is that once they start to break down in the chrysalis, the immune system of the caterpillar fights back really quite intently. But over time, the, imagine, the, the, the um, uh, imaginal cells, as they, as they get their act together, overwhelm uh, that pushback. We're seeing that pushback. We're seeing it with people with vested capital, uh, vested interests in the old uh, economy. Uh, we expect a lot more of that. But just go back to that slavery example. Very small actions by people who were thought to be extremists at the time, over time, really shifted the system. And that's what we're about to see again. Whether it's ecocide, whether it's dealing with the, uh, um, the planetary emergency, including climate. Now, some of you may uh, wonder why I'm holding this when it's illegal to have notes when you're doing a TEDx uh, talk. It's a prop. I'll, I'll explain it that way. But it's a prop for my memory. My memory is 72 years old. I think it was Paul McCartney who said, memory almost full. Um, we all struggle as we get a little bit older to remember uh, things. But I, I just want to leave you with a couple of points. Firstly, I feel I'm coming up with the most ferocious learning curve at the moment. And I feel that the next 10 to 15 years are going to be the most exciting, the most challenging, and the most, the politically the most demanding of my entire uh, working life, because now it's happening. Now we've got to take responsibility for what's happening and work with some of the key actors to make change happen in the right way. So the final point is just simply, when I face that somewhat challenging uh, future, what a comfort it is to think that uh, there are people like you in this room and again online uh, that we can work with as we build that next generation of butterfly effects. Because make no mistake, the powerful are beginning to listen, uh, whether it's in the private sector, public sector, or wherever. Uh, and we can really drive these things much faster over the next 10 years than we might uh, expect. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I, I was a little shocked to find that that was actually John's first TED, TEDx talk. Because I've seen so much of his other talks and I was just amazed that it's there. So it's actually a real privilege that he's actually done his first one here in my home city. So um, Our next speaker is a woman who is truly powered by nature and driven by purpose. With an exceptional track record in shaping impact strategies and campaigns. She's the global director of purpose and impact at Sale GP, the world's first climate positive sport. Here with her talk entitled A Podium for the Planet, please give a huge TEDx Glasgow welcome to Fiona Morgan. That was brave, eh? 
You clearly haven't actually seen the video where basically <laughs> the, Sc the Scottish Health Minister fell. <laughs> I didn't fall, thank goodness. You'll think this is an electric scooter. It's not. It's a time machine. I'm going to take you all to 2050, forward to 2050. Sports days have been cancelled. Your grandkids, your kids, they're not doing them anymore. The sports you love, you follow, they're unrecognizable. The World Cup's actually just been on. It's been played indoors, at night, and the stadium is completely empty. Why? Because 70% of the carbon footprint of the World Cup is spectator travel. So we banned them. How sad is that? Empty stadiums. Golf courses are eroding. They're literally crumbling off the coast. That whole sport is threatened. Winter sports. What winter sports? There is no snow, because last year, in 2049, it was the hottest winter on record. I'm sorry to say, this world I'm painting is actually already started. This summer, we had the Tokyo Games, and that was one of the hottest on record. It was 90 degrees average temperature, 55% humidity. Those poor athletes. And the athletics were some of the warmest ever staged. Then, remember the Australian Open tennis with the wildfires. The air pollution from the wildfires nearly stopped the qualifying tournament. Then 2019, even back then, Rugby World Cup. The super typhoon stopped games. A Scotland game, actually, I found out the other day, which was sad. So all of these things I'm depicting are linked extreme weather to climate change. It affects us all, even sport. But there is hope. Sport has the power to change the world, the power to unite, the power to inspire. It speaks a language to young people that they can relate to. And it does actually bring hope when there is only despair. And if you don't believe me, believe this very, very wise gentleman who said it a long time ago. But sport has to act. It can't just inspire, it has to do more. Sport is built on passion, a connection. You idolize and follow your fans and teams. So if sport is a platform for good, is sustainable, does, does things differently, fans will listen and fans will follow. And the good news is, some sports are starting already. So there's some great things happening. I don't know football fans, there'll be football fans here. Two weeks ago, there was the first ever net zero football game. Tottenham Hotspur versus Chelsea. Millions of people watched that game. And they were educated on climate change. They probably had no idea what net zero carbon was. And then they got educated on the small changes they can make. Football has 3.5 billion fans, quite a lot of people. Imagine every single sport, all those fans as a collective. If we can connect them to this problem that we need to solve and educate them, that is powerful. That will make a difference. But there is other sports that are beacons that I look up to, and they even have green in their name. So, Forest Green Rovers. The road to Forest Green Rovers is called Another Way, because actually, sustainability isn't about stopping things. It isn't doom and gloom, like people think. It's about doing things differently. It's exciting. So let me take you to a match day at Forest Green so you understand how it works, a sustainable sport. You arrive, they try to encourage everyone to come in electric vehicles, public transport or walking. So I get premium parking in my scooter right at the front. I plug in, 
go through the turnstiles. There's no tickets. You don't print paper. I mean, ugh. it's digital. You sit in your seat. The stadium is 100% powered by clean energy. Solar panels all down the roofs. You then go for your pie and pint or pie and wine, maybe at halftime. All vegan, plant-based food, and it is delicious. I can tell you. Even the football shirts that they're wearing, the players are wearing. Are made of recycled plastic bottles and coffee grounds. They have integrated sustainability, and the experience is still great. But sport needs to do more. Not every sport is a forest green rovers. We must raise our game together. We really must. So, oh, go backwards. Oh, how could I forget? Raise our game together.、Uh, but oh no, this is a good one. So it, the problem can feel huge. That's probably why I forgot it. It feels so big, unsurmountable. Even in sport, although we have this power, it does feel big, and it's a bit like me, very average tennis player, taking on Serena Williams. She's pretty good, if you haven't heard of her. And I am kind of the ranked outsider, winning a Grand Slam. But hang on. Did that not happen this summer at the U.S. Open? Sport can be the unexpected win. We can be the comeback for climate, for the planet. We really can if we act. We can do it. We have the power of sport behind us. So, I bet you're still thinking, what's that podium for the planet that she had at the beginning? Well, we get to the good stuff now. So, I work for a sailing championship. Most exciting racing on water, if I don't say so myself. We're nation versus nation, and our boats are foiling boats, so they're powered by nature, by the wind, by the sun, the solar batteries on board, and we have two podiums: one for sailing, racing; one for the planet. This season, we were the first sport ever to change the rules. We have embedded sustainability into our sport. The Impact League celebrates positive changes and reduction in the carbon footprint of our teams. Small changes, with ten criteria. The Impact League is shaking up sport, and it is making athlete activism the norm. So, ten criteria is a lot. Let me talk you through three, and they're very relatable because every business, every family, everyone here can relate to the topics that our teams are looking and working on. So, energy. How are our team bases? They have their own bases. How are they powered? Are they by wind? Are they by solar? And we really ask them to think: Are they being efficient of their energy? Are they turning their lights off? It is important. All of your homes. We need to be run by clean energy. Our events. We try everywhere to be 100% powered by nature, like our boats. Then transport. How are athletes getting to and from the events? This is why I have the scooter. This is what most of them use. It is delightful to see them scooting around cities, walking, biking. They think about how they get around. But it's not just about that. It's actually. Who's at the event, and do they actually need to be there? Because I think we have all found in COVID, remote working can be efficient. Maybe a bit boring, but it can be efficient. So, as a league, we really promote remote operations. We are a global league. We are trying to get our teams to travel less. We were the first sport to have remote broadcast operations. That means we save about 100 people traveling to our events. We even do remote umpiring. Sounds mad, I know, but it works. Our first event in Bermuda, we had an umpire in Auckland, New Zealand. Nothing bad happened. We had our Danish event recently. Our race director Ian was at the Tokyo Games. He was directing our race, and it can be done if you think differently. You have to innovate. Another criteria is food. We all know that we need to. Change the way we eat, more climate-friendly options. So we challenge our teams to eat less meat, less dairy, look at locally sourced products and packaging. What are they doing? And they love it. Honestly, the amount of vegans and vegetarians we've converted—it's incredible. And they tell their fans, they engage their fans in their menus. 
We even celebrate collaboration because isn't that why we're here? We all need to collaborate. We share the Impact League data, so we share the results. So everyone is learning and everyone is innovating. There is no loser in the Impact League. There are only winners. You probably think, who runs the Impact League? It's probably me, the sustainability team, the teams don't do much, it's the CEOs. That's where you've got it wrong. Everybody in the team is involved in the Impact League. Meet Jack. I love Jack. Jack, a year ago, he's in our New Zealand Shore team, a year ago, he didn't even think of the word sustainability. I don't think he knew what climate change was. It wasn't part of his business, his job. You know, he works in sailing. We have had five races in the Impact League, only five. And he has had a huge mindset shift. He is an inspiration, and he is the one that is pushing the changes. Every event we go to, I have Jack on the phone with ideas and inspiration. Things like, they might be small, but small changes add up. He sustainable zip ties. He's found a better, a better brand for us to use. He's taken some plastic off our sail that we didn't need. He's found an alternative. He is looking at circular manufacturing of our boat materials for drainage, for other things. That's Jack. He's doing that. You do not need to be a scientist, although very respectful of scientists, or CEO, again, are great, but you don't need to be that level or a sustainability lead. Everyone, everyone must act and understand their role in climate change or else we'll never fight it together. So, my challenge to you all is do things differently, think differently, Redefine success in your everyday life, in your business, in your sports organizations. You can do it. What is your podium for the planet? Who's your audience? Who can you engage and inspire? Who will follow you? Could be your kids or it could be your customers. Just use your voice for good. Be Jack. Be the unexpected hero for the planet. But you have to be brave. It is a bit scary sometimes, but you have to do it and act now. In sport, there are winners and losers, not in the podium for the planet, because when the planet wins, we all win. Thank you. <laughs> Fiona Morgan, everybody. I was going to say, I'm going nowhere near that scooter. Now, it's time to hear our final talk of the day, and it's being delivered by a speaker who believes that we already have the technologies and power to see the world not only survive, but to thrive. But that success all comes down to a matter of mindset. Delivering his talk, Climate Optimism, Building Our Future with Better Tools, please welcome environmental social scientist and Research Fellow at Rethink X, Dr. Adam Dorr. My daughter, Misora, is eight years old. And she knows I work on climate change. So not long ago, she asked me, Daddy, why do we have climate change? Well, I said it's, it's because some of the tools we use to make our lives nice hurt the earth. And she frowned and she thought about it for a moment. And then she said to me, Daddy, why don't we use better tools? the wisdom of child, better tools. What are tools? They're just knowledge. They can be physically embodied like a hammer or a shovel, or they can be intangible like facts or rules. But whether they're hardware or software, tools are simply practical knowledge. Their knowledge about how to achieve specific goals. And many of our goals involve solving problems. 
We see the world as one way, we wish it were another, and so we transform it with our practical knowledge. Outside this building, it's cold and wet much of the year, and yet here we are, warm and dry. The world is dark half the time, but we illuminate the darkness with the flip of a switch. We travel great distances with ease. Food is so plentiful now that we eat too much, as often as not enough. We live lives our ancestors 10,000 years ago couldn't begin to imagine. And their most pressing problems are trivial to us. And the only difference between us and them is that we have better tools. Now, I was fortunate to be raised in an environmentally conscious family. In the 1970s, when I was my daughter's age, I was not aware of climate change, but we were concerned about other environmental problems. The ozone hole, acid rain, lead poisoning. If you're young enough, you might not have even heard of those. If you're old enough, you might have forgotten about them. Now, we've gotten a handle on those problems, and it's not because humanity stopped using things like refrigerators. It's because we use better ones. Now, the world is not perfect. We still have many problems to solve. That's why I became an environmental scientist. But when I began my training in graduate school, I thought we were all there to learn about those problems so that we could discover how to solve them. But I was wrong. Instead, of being surrounded by like-minded optimists who believed we could solve our problems with ingenuity, I found myself surrounded by pessimists. And pessimism is contagious. The idea that we are doomed by climate change, that all other human progress has been for nothing, this is a pathogenic idea that has infected an entire generation worldwide, and it's dead wrong. There is greater cause for optimism today than ever before. My daughter could have said to me, we should stop using tools, but she's wiser than that. She saw that what we need are better tools. So let me show you why she was right. Today, almost 90% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from just three things. Energy, transportation, and food. Energy accounts for over half of all emissions. Transportation, about a fifth. Food, for about a fifth. So what's the solution? What should we do? Should we consume less of these three things? No. Thinking we can solve climate change by consuming less is like thinking we can save a burning building by putting out some of the fire. That's just not going to work. Now, of course, we need to be less wasteful. That goes without saying. But the solution is not less energy, transportation, and food. It's clean energy, transportation, and food. And the news here is nothing short of spectacular. Because all three of these foundational sectors of the global economy are poised for disruption. So what is disruption? It's when new technologies emerge that dramatically outperform and outcompete older ones, transforming industries or sectors as a result. Now, history shows us that disruptions are not linear. They always follow an S curve. They start out slowly, but then they explode exponentially 
before eventually slowing again as they reach saturation. And the new technology, as it grows, wipes out the older ones that can no longer compete. We used horses for transportation for thousands of years. And then a century ago, they were disrupted by cars in 15 years. Kodak was the titan of photography in 1995, the year the first digital camera came out. Today, when was the last time you bought a roll of film? Now, because they're not linear, disruptions are unintuitive. They tend to sneak up on us, and then suddenly, they unfold much, much faster than we expect in just a decade or two. For technologies of all kinds, we see the same pattern of disruption again and again throughout history. And disruptions do more than just swap a new technology in for an old one. Electricity wasn't just cheaper whale oil. Automobiles weren't just faster horses. Farming wasn't just more fruitful hunting and gathering. These better tools transformed energy, transportation, and food, and civilization along with them. And now, it's about to happen again. In energy, the technologies are solar power, wind power, and batteries. They used to be expensive, now they're cheap and they're getting cheaper by the minute. A decade from now, they will be overwhelmingly competitive almost everywhere. That's why they're growing exponentially worldwide. And fossil fuels? They are about to have their Kodak moment. Now, solar, wind, and batteries are not just cheaper coal. The new energy system will be built to handle the worst week of winter. It has to be. But what that means is that for the rest of the year, that system will produce extra energy at virtually no additional cost. So what would you call super abundant energy that's cheap and virtually free? Call it super power, and it's going to change everything. In transportation, the technologies are electric vehicles, autonomous driving or self-driving, and ride-sharing. They're cheap and getting cheaper, and they're growing exponentially, too. Electric, autonomous cars and trucks that don't need expensive fuel or a driver, they are going to move people and goods at a fraction of the cost of road transport today. And the system change that's coming is transportation as a service. When my daughter is 18, she won't need to own a car or even have a driver's license. She won't even need to be able-bodied to travel cheaply and safely, door-to-door, -door, any time of day or night. Now, it's obvious transportation as a service is going to change Everything. Combustion engine vehicles? Kodak moment. Well, what about food? Here, the technologies are precision fermentation, which makes proteins and other molecules from microbes, and cellular agriculture, which makes meat, leather, and other animal products from animal cells without harming the animals. The first commercial products have just become available. But a decade from now, my daughter won't be eating animal products. She will be eating food that is better in every way, tastier, healthier, and much, much cheaper. And it's because the new technologies compared to animal products are 10 times more water efficient, 20 times more time efficient, and up to 100 times more land efficient. And the system change that's coming in food is shocking. The end of animal farming, because animal products can't compete, 
That is going to free up an area of land the size of the United States, China, and Australia combined. So, just imagine what we could do with all of that land: conservation, reforestation, rewilding. The changes in the oceans will be stunning as well. They can recover once we're no longer strip mining them with four million commercial fishing vessels and traditional animal products from livestock and seafood. All of them. Kodak moment. So we already have the tools we need. They are science fact today, not science fiction. And they won't be expensive. Disruption happens because the new technologies are so much cheaper. That's what makes them unstoppable. We pass that critical tipping point. The system flips, and suddenly we have the immense power of markets working for us instead of against us. It would be extraordinary enough if even one of these foundational sectors were poised for disruption. But we are going to see all three of them disrupted simultaneously over the next three years. Over the next 30 years. I wish it were three years. So what did they give us? 90 percent reduction in net greenhouse gas emissions by 2035. That is far more progress, far faster than most of us would dare imagine. That is cause for real optimism. That's just the beginning. It gets better. What about all the carbon we've already emitted? What about the harm we've already done? To save a burning building, it's not enough to put out the fire. You have to repair the damage as well. In many ways, that's the harder part. But these same tools will allow us to withdraw carbon and heal the atmosphere and oceans affordably. So they open the door to a truly complete solution to climate change beyond just mitigation. That is cause for real optimism. And it doesn't stop there, because the same tools that help us solve climate change will help us tackle every other environmental problem as well. Deforestation, ocean acidification, air and water pollution. Habitat and biodiversity loss, waste processing and recycling—all of them become solvable with better tools. That is cause for real optimism. And there's still more, because it's not just environmental challenges. Every social goal becomes more achievable as well. Clean, cheap, abundant. Energy, transportation, and food—they are going to be massively liberating and democratizing. They will lift billions into prosperity. That is cause for real optimism. Now we can't be complacent. Every year that we delay increases the risk of climate catastrophe. So technology alone is not enough. We must make good choices. We, as individuals, as industries, as entire nations, must choose to accelerate these disruptions with our voices, with our votes, with our wallets. The sooner we do, the sooner we can meet this formidable challenge. But we can meet it. You don't need anyone's permission to be optimistic, and optimism can be just as contagious as pessimism. So get out there and be an optimism super spreader. My daughter was right. The solution is better tools, and we already have them. We can thrive, and and we can heal our planet at the same time. That is a future worth building for Misora, for all of our children. So let's start building it today, and let's build it together. Thank you. Thank you.
And don't wander too far, Adam, because I'm going to need you back on stage and uh, very, very soon. Uh, so that's it. That's the TEDx Glasgow 2021 talks officially done, which means we have to say a final goodbye to our live stream audience. Thank you so much for watching, and we really do want you to. We want to hear what climate actions you're going to be taking as a result of today. So do keep in touch with TEDx Glasgow via our social media platforms. And remember, if you are looking for practical ideas on how to make a difference, you'll find those climate action pledges on the TEDx Glasgow app. Thank you for watching. Now, while the talk.